Uh, first of all, welcome to this uh, seminar, which is a FEPRIN and Global Health Network uh, seminar on the topic of setting priorities for COVID-19 vaccine allocation, which is clearly a hugely important and pressing, pressing topic that, that we all uh, need to think very deeply about. Um, before I start introducing the speakers, can I just let you know that this uh, seminar is being recorded and that at some point during the course of the, uh, the seminar, uh, you'll get some information in the post in the chat, which will tell you where the where the seminar is going to be, where the recording is going to be posted after after this. Um, please, can you uh, use the chat function if you want to ask questions? So please do put your questions in there. What we're going to do is we're going to have the three presentations by the three speakers, ten minutes ten minutes each, and then we'll have the rest of the time, the rest of the hour for for discussion. Um, and I'll do my best to ask uh, all the questions, but obviously I may have to. Uh, choose choose between them if there are too many but so please do put your questions in there and we'll work from the from the chat um so yes without further ado let's we've got three great speakers for you today and a uh, really diverse and interesting audience welcome to the seminar and so i'm what i'm going to do without further ado is i'm going to introduce our well maybe i should tell you our first three speakers first so our three speakers today firstly we're going to have a, a presentation from sophie sophie matthewson who's a specialist Vaccine Policy and Investment at Gavi. Uh, following Sophie, we'll have a presentation from Professor Ruth Faden, who, as you all know, is the founder of the Berman Institute, and Philip uh, Franklin Workley, Professor of Biomedical Ethics at Johns Hopkins University. And the third speaker would be Professor Anand Barn, who is a researcher in global health and bioethics at uh, Yenapoya uh, University in India. So, uh, Sophie, uh, let's, I'll hand over to you so you can share your share your slides see if that works so i'm i'm not an ethicist by background that's the caveat so i really wanted to try and bring um some reflections on how um when we talk about allocation and setting priorities for covid 19 vaccine allocation um it, it's helpful to reflect on on some of the discussions that have been going on more broadly um in immunization um so just to outline how I'm going to use my time. I'm going to start by giving a brief overview in Gavi's engagement in COVID-19 and in particular around the, the efforts to um, develop and, and ensure that um, 2 billion doses of vaccine are available through the COVAX facility. Um, and secondly, by sort of providing some reflections on immunization priorities and, and how they've evolved, um, particularly in recent years and um, flagging some potential implications for, for looking at vaccine allocation and, and values. Um, so to give you a snapshot, um, Gavi's engagement in COVID-19 vaccines through the COVAX is part of a global effort to deliver 2 billion doses by the end of 2021. Um, and this sits within the broader ACT accelerator, which is looking at vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. We're working together with colleagues um, for, at CEPI Gavi, uh, and WHO, um, and the, the intention really is to build on the respective kind of comparative advantage of different organizations. So CEPI is investing directly in vaccine research and development um, and also in manufacturing. Um, Gavi's role is, is really ensuring that we're trying to link um, supply and demand. So pooling procurement and also incentivizing manufacturers to ensure the secure and rapid supply of safe and efficacious vaccines, um, which are globally accessible. And WHO is really leading on providing normative guidance on vaccine policies, um, safety regulation allocation. And I'm not going to go into detail, but I want you to be aware that WHO has developed a fair allocation mechanism for COVID-19 vaccines and also a, a SAGE values framework for the allocation and prioritization of, of COVID-19 vaccination. And, and I believe Ruth, Ruth will speak about sort of these, these um, documents and this process in a bit more detail. Um, so the goals of COVAX are to support the largest actively managed portfolio of vaccine candidates um, globally, to deliver 2 billion doses by the end of 2021, um, to provide a return on investment by delivering these vaccines as quickly as possible, obviously with the considerations around safety and efficacy, to guarantee fair and equitable access to vaccines for all participants, and um, to end the acute phase of the pandemic by the end of 2021. So it's really sort of looking at how vaccines and, and there can not just be available in theory, but, but also delivered um, to, to populations and accessible um, within sort of two years of the, of the outbreak being um, announced. 
Um, and, and sort of moving on, I wanted to, to highlight the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has really emerged at a critical point um, of discussion around what's the, the role of immunization within health systems, the contribution of immunization to supporting or um, sort of providing a cornerstone of, of primary health care, and also thinking about um, opportunities to, to align more closely with, with the work of other organizations for example, through the through the SDG agenda. So there's, and, and these reports all reflect sort of um, meetings or, or um, consensus documents that came out in, in the 2018 or 2019. So COVID-19 has really um, emerged um, in, in the aftermath of, of a lot of reflection by the immunization community on, on what we should be trying to do and, and what type of agenda we should be setting um, over the next decade. Um, so, first of all, um, the sort of first element that I want to highlight was that WHO has established an immunization agenda 2030, which builds on the end of the Global Vaccine Action Plan, which was covering the period 2010 to, to 2020. Um, and so this is giving a view through to 2030. Um, and to highlight that immunizations historically have built on the expanded program of immunization. So really looking at children up to the age of two years. And, and a new focus on life course immunization means looking beyond young children. Um, and this would represent a significant expansion of adult vaccination. Um, so, so currently um, there are a few, there's some vaccination programs which focus on priority groups such as healthcare workers and pregnant women. But when we talk about life course vaccination, we're really thinking about um, the, the sort of significant expansion to, to um, adults um, more broadly, as well as adolescents. Um, and the implications of this for COVID-19 are that vaccine delivery will really be contingent on identifying and reaching new target populations in a way that we haven't previously done, although there is, there is recognition of the potential value of, of that work. Um, and achieving the associated reductions in morbidity and mortality, which are what have been laid out, are, um, will require efforts to identify those populations and deliver vaccines as quickly as possible. And so work is ongoing, but I, I wouldn't underplay um, the significance of this um, as a challenge. Secondly, um, one of the other areas which has been a focus um, in particular sort of over the last five years, but, but also identified as a priority for Gavi for our next strategic period up to 2025 is equity. And, and recognition that there's a large or there's a significant proportion of children um, that do not receive any routine vaccines. And these are referred to as zero dose children. Um, and operationally that's defined as children who haven't had the, their first dose of DTP. Um, and, and the other thing which I think we're, we're increasingly um, looking to address is the fact that it's not just children but also missed communities. So, um, communities living in urban slums, communities that may be inaccessible, and, and those living in complex settings, including displaced populations, um, can represent significant um, clusters of under immunized children. Um, and that was um, a problem even before the COVID-19 pandemic, but is likely to be significantly um, increased as a result of, of the impact on routine immunization. Um, and, and even prior to the, the pandemic, we had recognized the need for specific approaches to, to reach those children. So by focusing on gender, um, demand, innovation, and, and um, community needs. Um, but this will need to be built upon and, and sort of thought about in, a much, in much more detail to be able to adapt routine immunization to the operating context. Um, and finally, I wanted to highlight, um, I think the importance of, of broader discussions around the links between health security and global health and development. Um, particularly in the aftermath of the 2014 West African Ebola outbreak, um, because I, I think that prompted a, a broad discussion around the role of immunization in addressing um, kind of critical challenges which affect research, health and development organizations and obviously countries. Um, and there's been a lot of discussions on how to better articulate and, and strengthen the links between um, outbreak preparedness and providing um, sustainable routine services. Um, and we've seen, we've also seen within CEPI an example of increased investment in R&D and manufacturing to address emerging and neglected pathogens with Nebsis on access, but that represents a very new model. So there's a huge amount of which has changed 
in the last five years, um, which is likely to reshape um, the way that health security is considered in the context of, of health and development. And so I think it's also important, as well as sort of citing the example of Ebola, to think about the breadth of other experience from vaccine preventable diseases. We know a lot about an international response to cholera, um, about the way that countries have thought about and um, responded to measles outbreaks. We know a lot about influenza um, and pandemic preparedness. Um, and I think it's important to think about how um, those, those contextual experiences um, are shaping our um, approach to emergency preparedness and response. And I think that it's as we think about product allocation and the allocation of vaccines um, in the context of the COVID-19 response, um, there's an opportunity to think about future um, approaches to equity and access and, and, and sort of linking between an agenda which has been emerging over, over recent years and also the, the kind of immediate challenges that are um, COVID-19 is, is posing in terms of systems and organizations and, and the ethical questions that we're facing now. So I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you. All right, okay, so quickly, I think, you know, um, uh, thank you, first of all, to Peprin for the opportunity. What I thought I'll discuss is maybe an LMIC lens around vaccines, ethics and access. And, you know, I wouldn't probably go into detail into frameworks because uh, Ruth will certainly do that. And she's been doing a lot of work on that but maybe highlight some concerns um, from an LMIC perspective, which I think is probably also a role which was thought through when I was asked to speak. So, you know, one, one thing very quickly to highlight is the fact that, you know, as we have seen this pandemic evolve over the last few months, it's also very clear that, you know, it clearly shows us the dirty underbelly of many of our health systems. And this is not just true of LMICs, it's also true of many high income countries. But the fact that we have leaky infrastructure, a shortage of human resources, there's been a systemic neglect, underfunding for many, many years. Um, probably decades in some in some countries, and also the fact that the regulatory systems sometimes are not very aligned with the you know with the, with the time when you want to go fast with developing vaccines or interventions, and sometimes they don't seem to be in sync with each other. They might not allow for some of the innovations which are being asked for, or sometimes you know they might be again you know uh, not agile enough to be able to capture uh, potential deficiencies, um, and you know those are being taken advantage of in the way. Uh, some of the development is happening. Now, this has been highlighted by many folks, including in India. You know, this was a paper which was published in the Times of India, one of our leading national newspapers, about the fact that, again, you know, uh, we're clearly seeing uh, chronic underinvestment and a neglect of uh, public health, and also some really strange uh, policy decisions by some of the science bodies involved. But, uh, you know, how is that also relevant uh, to what we are discussing? You know, one is that already we know that uh, for um, vaccine preventable disease uh, related immunization, we've not been able to reach immunization targets in many LMICs. You know, it's not like we have 100% coverage or for that matter, even 90% or 80% coverage in many LMICs. We are str struggling uh, to get there for many vaccines which have existed for decades. Also, many immunization systems have largely focused on an under five age group. You know, maybe uh, the other age group which has been targeted often is immunization for pregnant women. Um, and uh, in some cases, in some LMICs, uh, maybe HPV immunization in, the, in recent years. But beyond that, we haven't really had any functional immunization programs for anyone outside that age bracket. So if you were to actually have uh, a vaccine, a COVID-19 vaccine, which has to be delivered across age groups, as I think what uh, Sophie was also alluding to, it's really going to be a bit challenging because we really don't have that experience of doing that across age groups, what kind of administration modalities would you use? Where would you give it? Would it be school-based, for example? And if it is school-based for kids, then would you exclude kids, uh, a large proportion of kids who are out of school in LMICs? If uh, the other thing would be mode of delivery, if you're going with intramuscular, for example, that would mean a train, uh, need a trained health worker. Again, we know these are in short supply. So what kind of mode of delivery you decide? Something like an uh, oral polio vaccination program often can be done by volunteers. There are downsides to that, but then again, you know, what mode of delivery you choose will also influence the speed of uh, being able to cover large populations or not. Now, there is already data coming in that uh, immunization as it stands, which is also not at you know, effective coverage levels, has been further dampened uh, during steps such as lockdowns which are happening in countries. So this is data based on a national survey happening in rural India, which was released recently uh, by a portal in India, which showed that 
uh, around 42 percent of pregnant women in rural india did not undergo prenatal checkups as well as vaccination so already you know showing that even within the demographic where we know there are deficiencies in vaccination this has further gone down and similarly for um, households with kids that only 55 percent households uh, reported vaccination which means the corollary 45 percent did not have vaccination happening when it was time for a vaccine during the lockdown period now this is not just true of india this is also data which has been reported for many other countries nmic's this is in in fact we are already seeing for anywhere from tuberculosis hiv malaria maternal and child health but also routine immunization the fact that there might be around 80 million kids who might be at risk of vaccine preventable diseases uh, because of the impact of covid-19 on on global health and the delays which are happening uh, now very quickly transitioning to the research paradigm we know usually vaccines take at least a few years typically more than a decade sometimes longer to be developed everything is now being contracted uh, during times of this pandemic but then also a lot of questions being raised you know as you have countries which are coming up with vaccines which have sometimes even skipped uh, crucial phases you know they are being administered in some other countries in partnership in their own country with specific populations i'm not going into names etc but we already know that this is happening and then does raise questions and concerns around are we having some kind of a research exceptionalism and what um, you know what impact does that have on vaccine safety on vaccine efficacy on on being able to be confident about what we are using because we before we go to allocation i think these are the kind of ethics questions that we would all worry about that you know are we seeing some kind of uh, you know uh, uh, political pressures which are uh, leading to shortcomings in the way we would judge any vaccine candidate now uh, there is also data which shows that a lot of vaccine production as it stands now uh, based on what we know the manufacturers for the current lot of vaccines especially those which are in advanced stage seemingly indicates that the production capacity would be largely in um, the united states and europe unless they come up uh, with licensure uh, agreements with uh, producers in lmics like india but even then, you know, from an allocation perspective, we already know a lot of there's been vaccine nationalism. There's been a lot of pre-purchasing which has happened. So countries like the UK have already purchased five doses per capita, which is for every citizen that they have, they already have purchased five doses in advance, uh, working with various vaccine companies. And in many other countries, you haven't seen either a purchasing happening or much lesser than one. So already you are seeing a lopsided uh, mechanism where you have, uh, you know, COVAX coming in, but you know the uh, the share of the pie they might have access to compared to many other countries and the amount of money they've already pre-spent or have agreements for is quite staggeringly different and and that is something we should certainly worry about uh, you know uh, folks like the head of the welcome trust jeremy have talked about this being an issue the fact that you know one we need to have transparent rigorous assessment of the vaccines that we do trust being an important component of what we look at in public health and public health ethics but also fair access to any vaccine and you know where these vaccines originate should uh, should not influence uh, the fact that they should be made accessible to priority groups worldwide uh, including groups such as frontline health workers etc but is that really going to happen so as we all know india is a major manufacturer it is also called the pharmacy um, for lmic's we have some really large vaccine manufacturing companies but even if we look at uh, a section of the population as a priority population and one scientist says you know it should be around 30 percent of our population let's say people with uh, other illnesses first responders older adults that would be around 400 million people and that amount of doses even with our own production capacity because they have already been uh, tied up with agreements with pharma companies would be very difficult to make make available for for the indian population and this will take a lot of time. So again, you know, we're seeing even in countries or LMICs which have production capacity, it's not going to be easy. What are some of the other um, issues from an uh, access perspective? Issues around financing, you know, where will you get the money for, uh, for buying these vaccines? Is there going to be a reliable supply chain? Will you get doses in batches? And then, you know, you might not have doses available at some point of time. Are there fair mechanisms of distribution available? How are you going to address mobile populations of migrants, including those who might be considered illegal in many LMICs who are, not, who are outside the conventional health system? The fact that we might not have very strong pharmacovigilance and post-licensure systems in many LMICs, so we might not be able to pick up on adverse events, et cetera. And what kind of um, predictors for uptake will we start to see? This was an article which was just published today in India, which talked about the fact that even for meager resources like ICU beds, um, the, the way people could access them right now in the current pandemic, especially um, in, in many urban parts, 
was through connections. And what is meant by connections is you know someone who is a politician or you know someone who's a doctor or a health professional or a bureaucrat. And that is the only way you could access um, the few beds which were remaining and which were available. And if that is true of ICU beds, could that also be true of vaccines when they become available? And if they are not widely available, if you have only limited doses, would it mean that fair distribution mechanisms could be um, actually laid aside and what you would finally have is this kind of corruption happening, which is corruption based on how connected you are. Uh, the other uh, interesting uh, article which came out recently written up in a policy um, platform, it's a, it's a newspaper which is read by a lot of bureaucrats, it's also read by a lot of uh, business folks, argued that it's okay to let the rich people have first access to the vaccine. This is something which was written up uh, again for, for an, uh, with an Indian audience in mind and making the kind of arguments that we see that, you know, if the rich get vaccinated first by buying it at a market price, that's perfectly fine because that will help the economy to get revived. revived. And it's okay if, you know, if they have, uh, you know, priority access and that we should have, we should be looking at these kind of spatial pricing um, strategies, which allow for the rich to get ahead in the line. So, you know, thanks to Mahesh, I think is also on this, uh, on this webinar who highlighted this article and just shows that the kind of, uh, thinking which is already being pushed in LMIC is this is an art, uh, article written by someone who comes from a high income country, but clearly trying to influence policy thinking in this direction so that uh, maybe you know, it, it, it enables market access of a particular kind. So what are then some of the, uh, my thoughts around ethics issues as they might arise? You know, there's certainly going to be ethics and regulatory issues in vaccine R&D and we know many of them. There are issues around community and public engagement and need for understanding uh, you know, what are these vaccines? What kind of safety efficacy uh, basis do they have? What kind of vaccine allocation frameworks, both internationally and in country, are we going to use? And are, are these going to be based on fundamental ethics precepts of transparency, justice, inclusiveness, consistency? You know, uh, how are we going to look at targeted um, vaccination programs versus uh, uh, generalized vaccination programs? Who will get access first? Who will be the priority population? How will that be decided? Um, you know, and what are the cost implications on economies which are already hurting uh, over the last few months? And there is in many uh, states and countries uh, not a lot of money available to make purchasing. And what could be the consequences of rushing through uh, vaccine failures or vaccine safety disasters on not just COVID-19 vaccines, but also all the other immunization programs that we talk about? And how are we going to build the um, healthy health system enablers to actually get these vaccines to the target populations in the first place, even if they become available. So maybe I want to end with this uh, cover page from the Lancet uh, from an April issue this year that, you know, right now what we're seeing is a human tragedy, but it's also an opportunity for all of us who work in global health and who work in the ethics community to look at what kind of a society we would wish for after the pandemic has receded and how, you know, all the discussions that we do perhaps can be a gateway to get there, or at least, you know, this pandemic is an opportunity for us to rebuild some of the inequities in global health in a way that uh, you know we might not need to have some of these conversations and uh, we are able to address some of these um, you know these diverse um, issues of inequity that exist in global health so i'll stop there thank you so much for this opportunity and i look forward to the discussion so thank you for this uh, uh, opportunity to be part of the panel could i have the next slide please so i'm going to try to move relatively quickly uh, the primary focus of my talk turns on the challenge, the ethics challenges that come from different ways of understanding that we will not have enough vaccine. What does it mean to not have enough vaccine? I'm going to be speaking specifically to the WHO SAGE values framework uh, for the allocation and prioritization of COVID-19 vaccination, which was released uh, late last week. Next slide, please. This for this audience, and in fact, I think pretty much for everybody in the world now, it's it's not necessary to go through the extraordinary uh, impact that this pandemic has had on um, human well-being broadly understood. Just a couple of things to bring to your attention. I wanted to underscore a point that a not made uh, not made, which is that when we come later to do the reckoning of the impact of this pandemic on uh, on the health of individuals, uh, we are going and and sort of count up the global health burden and we are going to be counting many more uh, deaths and much more morbidity th than the various trackers the WHO or the Hopkins tracker currently uh, allows. Uh-oh, I've just lost my screen so I'm going to go back. I apologize. Thank you. 
uh, and I also wanted to to uh, underscore the impact on children. Um, it, the it, the peak of this uh, school closure phenomenon, we had 1.5 billion children more or less globally out of school. We have many, many, many children uh, in the hundreds of millions of children around the world who have never uh, been reinstated properly into school, we think, and the implications of this are, are far reaching, well beyond educational development for the well-being of children lifelong. Next slide, please. So uh, in what sense do we not have enough vaccine? Uh, we have uh, challenges at the global level and we have challenges within countries. Uh, again, to move, to move quickly, uh, the most profound uh, ethics considerations turn on the term that I believe Anant and, and perhaps Sophie also mentioned, which is now uh, become kind of part of everyday conversation in the worlds in which I operate, which is vaccine nationalism. This is a very uh, central challenge in thinking about global justice, global structural injustice, as well as uh, public health policy. We have no agreed upon understanding of what obligations countries have to populations outside their borders. Uh, as a pragmatic matter, the world is organized around nation states. Nation states, uh, understandably, politically and otherwise, uh, see their first responsibility to their own populations but at least even a minimal understanding of global um, justice would argue that countries are not released from that primary obligation to their own populations from um, obligations to populations outside their borders and so this is the sort of fulcrum on which we are trying to uh, balance a, a very very difficult uh, dance i'll return to this later uh, national prioritization is a key question within countries as well. Uh, we know there's going to be supply coming out of it, assuming we get vaccines that are worth distributing, and hopefully we will. Vaccines will be coming in tranches, and in the beginning, the supply will be severely constrained. Uh, there's a big difference between high income and low and middle income countries, however, on exactly how acute the prioritization phase will be. A prioritization challenge will be, uh, as already has been highlighted, high, in high income countries are operating under a reasonable assumption that they will have sufficient supply in a reasonably near term to be able to offer vaccine to everyone that the country chooses to offer vaccine to. Low and middle income countries also must make decisions about prioritization in relation to supply, but have no ex reasonable expectation of uh, the supply constraint being uh, relieved in the near terms. And of course, the reason that's the case is tied up with the problem of vaccine nationalism. Next slide, please. So uh, I am part of, the, of this working group. This is just a, to, to a very big flash, a, a sort of quick flash of my colleagues. Uh, we've been working together to provide uh, draft documents to uh, SAGE, the standing committee who released the values framework I'm about to talk about now. Next slide, please. So I wanna take a minute and step back and talk about why an ethics or values framework uh, for both allocation and prioritization of vaccines is helpful. Uh, and I would argue critically important if it's used properly. And I just wanna do this uh, again, super quickly. First, having an explicit framework of um, moral considerations or values commitments will help, should help policymakers think through competing needs and interests uh, because there will definitely, there already clearly are competing needs and interests more, more carefully. Uh, it also having a values framework that is explicit that underlies or provides the grounding for making difficult allocation and prioritization decisions minimizes the risk that uh, policymakers will overlook morally important uses and claims and perhaps um, equally important if not more important uh, an explicit values framework as the acknowledged foundation for difficult prioritization and uh, allocation policy decisions decisions should increase uh, accountability. With reasoning uh, transparent, it will be uh, easier for uh, people to understand and if not accept, uh, including groups and people who are losers as well as winners, uh, what in fact uh, is going on. Uh, more concretely, it allows for advocacy. So for countries or 
uh, groups, depending on whether we're talking about global allocation or national prioritization. Um, having explicit reasoning will allow for groups to advocate for their interests if, for example, they believe that they meet the criteria for prioritization or for a certain allocation of vaccine and uh, have not been included, they can now make their case more coherently. And finally, and I think this is incredibly important, it allows for more explicit and hopefully more on point criticism and perhaps for the opportunity to change prioritization and allocation policies. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the goal statement from the values document that SAGE has released. This is the goal overall for COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, and you will see that it speaks to equitable protection and promotion of human well-being among all people of the world. Next slide, um, please. The, I feel like it's, uh, you know, 1950. Could I have the next slide, please? It's sort of very odd that to be in control. Can we go back? I'm sorry, that was not meant. I'm sorry, I was just making a side comment. I apologize. So the uh, values framework that SAGE has released identifies six core principles. I just will note that in prospect, uh, the framework operates with all five being of equal moral importance with the exception of reciprocity, which is understood to be a narrower uh, principle that is important to take account of, particularly in uh, national prioritization plans, but also uh, globally, uh, but is not of the same sort of magnitude of, of significance as the other five. Next slide, please. I want to reprieve just two uh, of the principles very quickly, just to underscore what I've already sort of intimated is the thinking behind the stage values framework, which is uh, while health has been profoundly negatively impacted by this pandemic, it's important to appreciate and recognize that what, it what is at stake is pretty much every dimension of human well-being. And so uh, we concern ourselves not only with uh, thinking through allocation and prioritization decisions from the standpoint of promoting health as one dimension of well-being, but also social and economic security, uh, human rights and civil liberties. And again, I want to underscore importantly, child development. And next slide, please. The other, I'm, all of the principles, of course, uh, are worth discussion and uh, attention, but the other one I wanted to bring uh, particularly uh, forward in the context of this webinar is legitimacy. And here again, Anant has, uh, Anant has presaged sort of one of the things that has up, been uppermost in the thinking of the people who helped draft this um, this document, which is the con concern about decisions being legitimate ones, whether they are made at the you know legitimate global decisions and legitimate national decisions, what legitimacy would mean, and a particular concern, particularly at the national level, about uh, corruption and and corruption is discussed in the document. Next slide, please. So this is not meant for anybody to read. This is just to sort of illustrate, sort of visually, really at a glance. Uh, how the values framework operates in the SAGE uh, document. The six principles are identified and then they are specified into particular objectives. So there are six principles, there are 12 objectives. The objectives in red, there are five of them, are of the sort that allow for the further specification into priority groups. Next slide, please. These are examples of the priority groups that have been identified. There were 20 some odd priority groups that were identified. And the next process, of course, the one that SAGE is involved in now is identifying uh, priority groups for different epi and uh, supply scenarios. Next slide, please. That is where things get really difficult. So uh, this is my attempt to illustrate the tremendous puzzle that uh, anyone involved in the prioritization process now or the allocation process now struggles with uh, what we are uh, working on. And I should be careful to say I'm not, and, and I want to be very mindful. I don't speak for WHO. I'm not an employee of WHO. I'm just a participant in one of the many uh, remarkable uh, working groups and advisory groups that have been set up by WHO to assist uh, in this context. So the struggle now is trying to situate the values objectives 
and the principles that lie behind them in the specific fact situations and the uncertainties as we get closer to vaccine access. I mean, excuse me, vaccine authorization and the, and uh, distribution. So I won't go through all of these, but these uh, are all, each of these represent kind of head scratching challenges that uh, we are working through uh, together. Next slide, please. I wanted to end on the global equity uh, principle uh, and uh, underscore the strong position that is taken in the document on global equity obligations as they fall on wealthy countries. So there are two specific obligations that are not nearly as specific as one would like in terms of the real world, but it is these are strong statements that take the position that countries with sufficient financial resources should refrain from undermining vaccine access to low and middle income countries by contributing to market conditions that substantially disadvantage countries with less economic power. This is a, a very important um, set of considerations that is captured here, speaking to, for example, Anant's point about the UK having secured um, sufficient vaccine for arguably five doses for um, every person in the country. The US is about a threefold. Of course, we recognize that countries with uh, sufficient resources are laying bets. No one is certain which vaccines are going to cross the finish line, but nevertheless, this is a way of taking advantage of pre-existing dramatic uh, uh, market power differentials to secure vaccine clearly beyond uh, national need, or at least arguably behind, beyond national uh, a need in ways that just make uh, the market for the rest of the countries rigged very much against them. And finally, an obligation on the part of financially able countries to participate and contribute, uh, participate and support, excuse me, we ex expressly didn't want to use the word contribute, participate and support approaches to ensure access to COVID-19 vaccines, a shout out to the COVAX facility, but also to recognize that for countries such as my own that are not at least currently going to participate in the COVAX, COVAX facility, that they nevertheless have obligations to participate and support in, in the uh, securing of something approximating equitable access globally through bilateral procurement mechanisms and other means of support. So I'll stop there. Thank you. That was that was great, Ruth. Thanks very much. Thanks to all all of our speakers, um, Sophie and Aunt and Ruth. That was that's given us a fantastic kind of uh, insight into the important questions, and looking forward very much to the to the discussion. Um, maybe if you guys just uh, chip in when you feel that you've got something to say to a particular question, I'm going to try and pick some out from the from the chat. But I'll just start off with one that I got in advance. Just give me a bit of moments to, to catch my breath. Um, so this is from Catherine Enright, and all of you in various ways mentioned the importance of engaging uh, communities, affected communities. So one of the questions here is, I suppose, you think it, uh, it's, uh, of allocations at different levels, at the global level and the national level, how do you adequately capture the voices, so the concerns, beliefs and values, etc., of, of people who are relevant to the discussion, but generally kind of hard to reach, so the generally um, marginalized in one way or another. How, how in practice has that happened and how do you think it, or how do you think it could happen better? I mean, Anant, you made me maybe made the most explicit reference to that. So do you want to go first, maybe? Sure, yeah. So I think it's certainly going to be a challenge. I think, you know, we've, we've seen a failure of being able to communicate, I think, through the pandemic as well. I mean, that's partly why we are not seeing adherence to public health measures around masking, around physical distancing, around hygiene measures, you know, in, in many countries like my own, uh, often the response has been a law and order response, which is a policing response based on curfews and fines, but not necessarily working with local communities about ownership of, uh, of decision making and owning the public health response. Now, uh, you know, there have been some positive deviants, um, you know, it's happened in areas where there is a strong local self government, where there is a communication chain right from the, the state level or the federal level 
uh, right down uh, to the local self-government involving uh, you know communities involving self-help groups including uh, women's groups including church-based organizations including youth groups and working with them to actually own that response and when they actually understand why it's important for communities to participate in the response we've seen much better uh, the response to um, to adherence measures and maybe that's 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 what we need to then sort of take into the vaccine allocation scenario if there are mechanisms like this you know in research we talk about community advisory boards we talk about gatekeepers etc who we work as uh, you know as, as a with as a platform to get some of these messages out and and try to get some responses from communities there are you know there are in the public health spaces um, also these kinds of uh, community groups or community leadership fora which we can leverage and may, maybe those conversations need to start now uh, rather than waiting for a vaccine to be available and having those conversations. So one of my concerns is a lot of decision making around this and thinking around this in many LMICs is happening in the capitals of the country, in committees, um, you know, within expert circles, but not necessarily, uh, you know, democratized in the ways uh, that we are having some of these conversations actually happening with communities and community representatives. And maybe we should start engaging more of that. Okay. Ruth, did you look like you want well, to Well, I, I would just I would just add and certainly in support of everything that Anantia said. When we think about when I think about uh, engagement of relevant stakeholders and especially people who are uh, who are relatively voiceless at the global level, uh, the focus for me is engagement with countries who are going to be affected by the allocation decisions and making sure uh, making sure and trying to develop structures which i think uh, has defined at least some of how the who is operated here that um, entail consultation with especially the countries uh, the low low and middle income countries who are going to who have the least power and the and the, will be most affected by decisions that are made at, at the global level about allocation at the national level uh, the the concerns with respect to legitimacy are extremely high stakes. Um, not only are we worried about, I am worried about appropriate um, voice and involvement of um, groups in society, in, in national societies who are comparatively powerless, but also a deep worry that the typical technical experts will also be uh, sidestepped. Uh, because of the political character of decision making now around everything having to do with this pandemic and certainly the vaccines will be no exception. So the worry that uh, even the things that we tend to typically take for granted some significant role for technical experts in making uh, vaccine policy is in jeopardy. So it's a, a very, a very, very troubling picture from the standpoint of, let's say, the broad, broad, broad bucket of legitimacy and vaccine policy making. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, Sophie, do you want to add anything to that? I don't have much to add, but just to say, I think there's a risk of sort of all of the gains and, uh, and uh, uh, models of good practice being lost in the urgency of sort of trying to solve one problem and we've already seen it's much more systemic. And so I think where, where there can be sort of reminders of opportunities and mechanisms to increase representation and build trust and think about legitimacy, it, it's, they may not be as prominent on the technical agenda as vaccine development, but they are as critical to ensuring that, that products are available and that agree. Sort of operationally things work as well. So I, I guess that, I mean, that's something that I think all of us have a responsibility to do, but it's something that we definitely shouldn't forget. Great. Um, I've had a few questions and comments relating to the how, the prioritization in terms of different age groups, for example, children versus older, older people, different groups and so on. So just putting those together, I just wondered, maybe start with you, uh, Sophie, given that you presented that first, to what extent how we should think about, about prioritization. So there's a tendency in some, in some ways to talk about prioritizing vulnerable groups. But there are also other issues here, like, for example, and this is a question from Sofia Salas and, and Alberto Giubilini mainly, I think. So you've got on the one hand vulnerable groups, but, uh, but those may not neat, matchly, neat, neatly match onto the groups where the vaccine is most effective. 
So, you know, there may be tensions between those, those things. So to what extent do you think, you know, we should be prioritizing in terms of need and to what extent do you think we should pr be prioritizing in terms of effectiveness? Do you have any thoughts about that? I don't have any thoughts and, and would sort of defer to Ruth given the sage link, but I think the other dimension to look at is, is the system capacity because where we're having to build um, capacity to reach healthcare workers from scratch and it sounds as though it's something obvious that many countries don't have registries, they don't have um, definitions that enable um, inclusion of um, community healthcare workers or, or unpaid workers who may be, may be at risk. So. Um, I'll make your problem more complicated rather than solve it, but I, I agree that it's it's really critical to address. That is certainly complicated. Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, Ruth, or Anand, Ruth, do you want to... yeah, Anand, do you want to go next, or shall I? It's, I'm fine either way. Yeah. Go go ahead, Ruth. All right. So I I um you know that that puzzle piece slide that I put up. Yeah. <laughs> this is a. a, a a special but very very prominent instantiation of the big big puzzle that that I the decision makers who will have to make the final calls I hope will take into account uh, with speci with specific um, reference to uh, older adults versus younger adult younger adults and children. Uh, we know that the burden of disease and uh, death is disproportionately weighted towards older America, older adults. It, where exactly the cutoff is for older adults varies to some extent by where in the world you are and obviously the age structure of the population. The questions that are emerging are how do we kind of piece that together from the standpoint of what we will not necessarily have evidence about when vaccine first becomes available, which is whether there is differential effectiveness with respect to disease prevention, no, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, disease, serious disease uh, prevention and uh, reduction in deaths by something, you know, immunosenescence, but basically what happens to the immune system as people age. So there's that piece. Uh, we won't have very good evidence when vaccine first becomes available about whether the vaccine can um, reduce transmission. So that's another big piece. And we're going to have to make these decisions, though, before we have the specificity about vaccine characteristics, in part for something that Sophie and I think Anand just both mentioned, which is that uh, uh, public health systems in countries need to be preparing for how they're going to deliver vaccine to populations that they're not used to delivering vaccine to. And yet, that's yet another piece is, well, if we, we can have all the priority groups that we want carefully ranked and beautifully justified in relation to a very articulate or, or at least acceptable values or ethics framework, and it'll all fall apart if vaccine either cannot be uh, made available to people in the priority groups for distribution and systems and logistics issues, or people don't want to take the vaccine, which is mm. also an issue. So uh, while it, we can have um, kind of our general debates about whether we should go for years of lives sa you know, saved or lives saved, and these are all you know, territories that, that we know well in, in ethics and uh, allocation challenges, when you get to the concrete of what's going to happen in this pandemic with the vaccines as they get rolled out, it's, it's just, it's, it's just hard. It's just really hard. Thanks. Um, I'm going to come to you and I'm with a question in a second, but before I do, that was a quite a nice segue into the next seminar, which is on vaccine hesitancy. So maybe this is an opportunity to tell all the, tell all the people on, okay. online that the next of these seminars is going to be on the 5th of October on that topic. So that's clearly a factor in, in, in all of these all of these matters. Um, yeah, and I mean, we can't end this session without talking about the obligations of rich countries, I think, given that that's such an important issue. And, you know, I uh, just to be devil's advocate question. I suppose the obvious question to ask is, you know, you can see how from some perspective it's right for a country to do what it can to protect uh, the health of its citizens and when there's genuine uncertainty about which vaccine will come to fruition as it were and to as it be available and be effective you can see that at some level that's the right thing to do as it were um so i just wonder if you could kind of give us an argument about about well firstly you know why they're wrong and secondly what we can do about it if anything so anand you're you're uh, uh sorry to put you on the spot but it's uh, very interesting to hear your views 
No, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I get that argument. I mean, I, I think that's what politicians would leverage and, and that's what politicians are going to use um, as a rationale. But listen, I mean, the one thing we've learned about pandemics and we've had a few now over the last 20, 30 years is that, you know, we are a very interconnected world. By being inward looking, actually, we are going to make ourselves more susceptible. If we don't have um, a, a global population which is protected, uh, you know, there's this. Might, you might get over COVID-19, but you might not be able to get over future uh, infections. Um, so, quite honestly, I think you know uh, it's also trust in bodies like WHO, which is at stake. If people feel that we are having a failure of multilateral institutions in being able to actually respond to pandemics and ensure um, access to interventions like vaccines in a fair way, especially for priority populations, then we will actually probably see a further shriveling away um, and, and a more nationalistic sentiment uh, taking uh, prominence in global health. And that is something I don't think any of us wants because we've seen that becoming a problem. I know in, in Southeast Asia, you know, we discussed this maybe around 12 years ago in, in, a, in a workshop in Hanoi, where there were scenarios where because neighboring countries were in conflict with each other, they wouldn't disclose um, outbreaks um, in border areas. And that would mean that populations could easily be at risk because people were just not willing to say that we, we had an outbreak. And that lack of information sharing meant that everyone across the border uh, was, was at risk. You know, microbes don't need passports or visas. And that just shows how interconnected we are you know, with travel, uh, with, uh, with cross-border migration, et cetera. So I, I think in, the, in a world which is increasingly globalized, I think there is a lot of dependence on each other as well. And you're not going to be, insulate, uh, be able to insulate yourself from those risks. Um, even with uh, COVID-19, we don't know how long immunity lasts. We don't know how long immunity with vaccines would last. So maybe you could get the first lot of vaccines out, but you, know, you could always have populations at risk. By maybe ensuring that we are more fair and equitable, we'll be able to protect the global community um, better and, and and I think that is probably that 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 way equity and fairness is, is is a good protection for us in global health. It's not just about the principles, but it actually is about protecting our own populations. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Ruth, you have something to add to that? I'm sure. Well, uh, I would say, um, I guess I would say three things really quickly. Uh, one is that uh, I think it is possible to mount very compelling arguments from the standpoint of, of global structural justice, why wealthy countries uh, cannot be, um, should not be indifferent, why it's impossible we, uh, in the end to sort of justify a complete a thoroughgoing vaccine nationalism. Uh, but I'm not sure how persuasive those arguments are going to be. So there's that. Uh, I'm big about shaming. I think shaming is really important. I think loud voices are really important. Uh, the argument from the sort of standard public health argument, as long as there is, you know, infection or active outbreaks uh, anywhere, there's a risk um, at home as well. Uh, it gets a little bit complicated depending on what we will uh, learn about the effectiveness, the actual uh, use effectiveness of particular vaccines and whether countries think they can mount a sufficient uh, way of protecting their own populations in terms of their health with a combination of vaccines and other interventions. So that's, you know, it's an argument we like to make, but it's, a, it's an argument that it actually can be challenged depending on what we're going to learn uh, about the vaccines. The argument that I think, um, if the argument to self-interest that may in the end be the most persuasive, or not giving up on the, on the global you know, uh, vaccine, I mean, the global argument in terms of infection anywhere means the risk of um, infection at home, is the global interconnectedness economically. Uh, it's really hard to imagine the economies of wealthy countries fully recovering whatever fully recovering means as long as we have complete uh, um, uh, insecurity about global supply chains, for example, and also um, global markets. So instability in global markets and instability in global supply chains um, that causes problems for wealthy countries. And, uh, and so that may be in part what ultimately prevails. I, I would like to think it, it would also be a, a, a recognition that it's uh, just uh, completely morally egregious to have a scenario in which, say you're vaccinating well beyond what you need for any plausible public health argument, uh, your own population when you, you know, 
large parts of the world are not being able to go past three or 10 or 15 or even 20% of their populations. I'll stop there. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, Sophie, do you want to have the last word on this? I, I mean, I don't think I have much to add in terms of the arguments, but I think as a, as a community or as a discipline, sort of global health is relatively young. And this is really, if we, if we can't make the arguments for um, some degree of solidarity, however naive and, and kind of considerations of justice and ensuring that um, key groups don't, aren't marginalized from, from access to, to these kind of critical products, then I, I think we're, we're really gonna struggle to, to justify some of the work that we do in the future. So I, I don't know what arguments will, will be compelling in the end, but I, I really hope they work because I think this is sort of a, a moral reckoning. Well, that's, um, yeah, and uh, Anant's last slide, I thought in his presentation captured that really nicely. Yeah, so thanks very much to all of our speakers for that fascinating session. I've chaired three of these now. I think this is the fastest hour I ever live. It goes, goes so quickly, but it's really great. Uh, thanks to all the participants for coming along and for your comments and questions. I apologize for not being able to ask all of them or even many of them. Um, but as I look forward to seeing you all on October the 5th at the next, uh, next of these seminars, as I say, which is on vaccine hesitancy. So thank you very much, all of you.